and greetings saints of the Most High, Rod Thomas here, and I want to welcome you to this installment of the Messianic Tour Observer. As always, hoping, trusting, and praying that this installment of the Messianic Tour Observer finds you, your families, and fellowships well and blessed. Have a very, very packed installment for you here today, so I'm not going to spend much time in the housekeeping today, but as I am recording this installment of the Messianic Tour Observer, we are at the 12th day of the biblical calendar, and we are just two days away, actually, as I'm recording and editing and posting, we're actually a day and roughly a little bit under a half (laughs) before Pesach actually hits. And so we are entering officially the spring feast. I mean, we actually kind of entered the spring feast with the first of the month of the Aviv, back on um back 315 of 2021 and now we are here just a day and a half before passover and i have to tell you i love the fall i love the spring and the fall feast i love them equally because i always i used to say that i (laughs) i used to say that i liked i would say i love the spring feast above, you know, beyond or better than I like the fall feast. And then I'd go through the spring feast, loved it, enjoyed it, grew in it. All the good things that you're supposed to get out of keeping Yah's feast, which is wonderful and beyond anything that I could ever imagine doing. Um, And then, you know, you go through those months of dryness with no with no feast (laughs) through the summer until you get to the fall. And then you start to say, man, I can't wait for the fall feast to come. And then when the fall feast start to come upon you, you say, man, I love Sukkot. I love atonement. I love day of of the trumpets, blowing of the trumpets. I love the fall feast. I love them above the spring feast. And then you go through this circle. So I've stopped picking one set of feasts over the other. I simply like the Feast of Yah, the seven mandated feast. And it is the highlight of every Torah observant, covenant walking believer in Yeshua Messiah. It's the highlight of their calendar year. Well, at least it should be. So we are excited to receive these spring feasts here in 2021. And we're going to touch upon the spring feast here in our discussion entitled Paul on being under the law, part three, keeping Passover 2021 and sin consciousness. As I promised last week, I'm going to still touch upon this series within a series and kind of try to bring this thing to a close here in the next week or two. But I'd also wanted to comment upon the spring feast. So we're going to do a, both. We're going to take both tasks the day and uh, knock that out. A lot going on note wise here that many of you may not be in a position to take notes uh, during this discussion. So as always, visit the website www.themessianictourobserver.org www.themessianictourobserver.org There you'll find all of my notes. Every bit of them there with the biblical references and any kind of extra biblical references I make during this discussion are there right there for you. So you don't need to take notes. You can get them and do whatever you need to do in order to be in sync in order to verify what I'm saying is true, conduct and do your own study. So happy to be here. And with that housekeeping out of the way, let's get into today's discussion. Part three of Paul on being under this, under the law, keeping Passover 2021 and sin consciousness. So we find in first Corinthians chapter five, verse six, where Shaul writes, and this is the complete Jewish Bible rendering, he writes to the Corinthians, get rid of the old hamets so that you can be a new batch of dough. Because 
in reality, you are unleavened. For our Pesach lamb, our Passover lamb, the Messiah, Mashiach, has been sacrificed. Again, that was 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7. How appropriate for this time of year, would you say? And this, of course, fits right within our discussion series on being under the law or under Torah. So, in the interest of continuing along in our series within a series so that we can ultimately answer the question of what Paul meant when he wrote that sin no longer had dominion over his Roman readers as they were no longer under the law, but under grace. I want to touch upon the concept <clears throat> of sin consciousness. Sin consciousness. And I want to give you my thoughts and reflections on the spring feast of Jehovah, Yahweh, Yahuwah, however you declare his name, which begins, as I mentioned in my opening, this weekend, at least for most of us. I'm not going to get into any calendar issues, any calendar disputes, calendar disagreements. That's for another day. But yes, for the vast majority of us, we're looking forward to receiving Pesach this coming weekend. So let's begin our discussion by conducting a brief contextual overview of 1 Corinthians chapter 5, wouldn't you say? And we learn from verse 1 of this chapter, again, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, if you want to follow me in your, in your Cephers, your Bibles, we learn here in verse 1 that Shaul had received word from a member of the Corinthian assemblies that a male member of their assemblies was engaged in a most inappropriate sexual relationship with his father's wife. And that's verse 5, the latter part of verse 1. Chapter 5, the latter part of verse 1. And most of you should be familiar with this story. It's a well-known, well-taught-on, well-discussed story in the Pauline album of writings. And based upon the apostle's response to this situation, it would seem that he was taken aback by the exceptionally disgusting nature of this man's sin. You know, I find it interesting, as an aside, that the apostle only makes mention of the male who was involved in this sinful relationship. He makes no mention of this man's mother-in-law. So, I'm asking, is it possible? Is it possible that this man's mother-in-law was not a member of the Corinthian assemblies, but only this man was a member of that assembly? I'm just throwing that out there as a... Matter of interest. Continuing. For what we know about Shaul, Paul, is that he was a well-traveled soul who by virtue of his apostleship to the Gentiles or the Goyim, he would have no doubt been exposed to a vast array of cultures and social practices. And his response to this situation <laughs> based upon his own travel experiences his own experiences rubbing elbows with various cultures and races and creeds and so forth and so forth well it compelled him to inform his readers his corinthian readers that such disgusting sinful behavior was not even practiced not even heard of by the peoples of heathen nations. And Shaul's direct accusative statement here causes me to believe, it's just my belief, that the transgressor in this case was a Messianic Jew for the simple reason that the apostle comments that, hey, 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 guys, not even heathens behave in so vile a manner as this. <laughs> the apostle, of course, would have immediately recognized that such shocking behavior was in violation of Torah, specifically Leviticus chapter 18, verse 8, and Deuteronomy chapter 22, verse 30, which reads, The nakedness of thy father's wife shalt thou not uncover. It is thy father's nakedness. 
Shaul would have also realized that the punishment to be had for such an exceptional violation of Torah was the divine judgment, that is, a curse, as indicated or as indicative in Deuteronomy chapter 27, verse 20, which reads, Cursed be he that lieth with his father's wife, because he uncovereth his father's skirt. And of course, both of these passages in tour that I just read are from the King James Version. The phrase, uncovereth his father's skirt, interesting, isn't it? Is a, what is known as in scholarly lingo, a circumlo circumlocution. <laughs> a circumlocution, even I get tongue-tied with that that term, a circumlocution, which means a vague manner of speaking, a vague way of saying, in this particular case, this individual or any man or so who goes and has an inappropriate sexual relation or relationship with his father's wife, well, he dishonors his father by doing what he's doing. So that's what it means to uncover one's father's skirt. I also believe that the use of this vague manner of speaking, because <laughs> of course it comes to your mind, well, why would they say you uncovereth your father's skirt? That makes no sense to me. Does my father wear a skirt? No, 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 no. The vagueness of this, this circumlocu circumlocution, <laughs> circumlocution, is a manner of speaking which is seen throughout scripture. And it is the ancient writer's method of exercising a sense of decorum, decency, if you will, by not giving any more attention to the heinous act than already is readily known. Sometimes you have some class when you're addressing an issue. We don't necessarily see that today. It's kind of a foreign practice to have decorum when you're writing because People aren't stupid. I think, I bet you dollars to a donut, most of you know what it meant that <laughs> you don't lie with your father's wife because you're uncovering your father's skirt. Well, you know what this means. But, you know, the, the writer, Moshe, Moses, was using decorum. Let's continue on. Deuteronomy 27 is recognized by some as the 12 curses chapter of Torah. Now, the curses mentioned in this chapter, chapter 12, uh, or 27, I'm sorry, of Deuteronomy, are directly attached to certain behaviors or actions by people that fall into a class of sins that the Almighty has deemed particularly troubling. These sins include idolatry, exercising dishonor of or disrespecting one's parents, big one big one, moving property boundary lines with the intent of absconding a portion of another's rightful property, intentionally harming the blind, causing injustices or harm to come upon the helpless of one's community, incest, and other forms of sexual immorality, murder, bribery, especially for purposes of perverting justice, and just outright disobedience of Torah. The Eternal himself would mete out his righteous judgment upon those who commit these transgressions. So the use of the term curseth to describe what is to happen to these particular or transgressors. Now, the Hebraic understanding of one being cursed goes well beyond mere wishing that some form of ill will or bad fortune would overtake the transgressor. In fact, the curse itself carried with it power, power, supernatural power to bring upon or bring about a negative effect. A sin that Yah has deemed worthy of a curse signifies that at some point, he, Yah, would intercede in the situation and render judgment himself. 
which would most likely result in the transgressor's death. It's a very good possibility. So the harshness of the judgment was intended to bring an end to that evil, which has the negative spiritual capacity, if you will, of tainting the land. What was it that Shaul wrote? That a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? In other words, when such transgressions are allowed to go unaddressed and unpunished, that sin acts as though it was a contagion. And that contagion has the great potential of spreading and infecting other members of the community. So such transgressions must be immediately addressed and immediately purged from the community before it spreads to the rest of the community. So Shaul recognized that he had to put an immediate stop to this disgusting affair. Before, before its effects would spread throughout the assemblies, or Yah himself brought down judgment upon the whole of the community. This situation was made all the more tragic and troublesome to Shaul in, in that the assembly members were aware of this cursed relationship. The Corinthians, in particular, their leadership, well, they were in fact tolerating. They were allowing the cursed behavior to go on in their midst unabated. And we see this in chapter 5, verse 2. Obviously, at least one person, that soul who reported the transgression from the beginning, was as troubled about the problem as Shaul was. So the apostle took those who either turned a blind eye to the transgression or who encouraged it, that is, described as those proud or puffed up over the situation, and he shamed them. He shamed them for their lack of righteous responsibility in dealing with the situation. The community, Shaul chided, and was responsible they were responsible for removing the fornicator, removing the transgressor from their midst. That was their responsibility. So the supposed renewed hearts of the community and her leaders, that is their attitudes, according to Shaul, should have been diametrically opposite to the permissive heart or attitude they were displaying in response to this situation, which essentially favored the transgressor in his transgression to persist in their midst. The renewed heart of the people of the assembly should have been one that mourned over the occurrence of this situation in their midst, verse 2. And according to the apostle, it should have been all the more apparent to them upon their learning of and confirming the existence of this evil that they would have to immediately expel the individual from their midst. It should have been apparent to them. In fact, Shaul in verse 3 inserts himself in the equation by stating that he was outraged by this situation and he had already, uh, he, well, let's just say he had already formed judgment in his heart, Shaul's heart, and in his mind as to how this situation should have been handled by them. So Shaul, in effect, was shaming the assembly members by saying that he himself did not need to be there to know what needed to be done. And this is ver verses 3 and 4 of chapter 5. So instead of proudly permitting such evil to transpire in their midst, Shaul was saying to the Corinthians they should have acted in accordance to Yah's word. It is obvious to me that there were, at the very least, some Jewish Messianic members of the assembly who, well, who would have known better and who should have been the first to step forward and speak out against the situation since they were versant in Torah, or at least they should have been. 
So the apostle directs the assembly members to imagine him being in their midst when they meet together to address the issue. And knowing the apostles' mind and heart on this issue, they had no other choice but to expel the sinner from their midst, leaving him to the consequences of his sin. The ultimate goal of such an action on the part of the community leaders was not so much to render harsh judgment upon the offender, because saying, go away, bye-bye, is really not harsh judgment. It really isn't. I'm sure it, the man didn't lose a horrendous amount of sleep when they told him to go bye-bye. So it really wasn't that harsh. Indeed, we, as we noted just previously, such transgressions, according to Torah, had the potential of being directly addressed by the Almighty himself. So righteous judgment would at some point be rendered or meted out upon the offender by Yah. The ultimate purpose, however, in expelling that member from the Corinthian assemblies was to purge out the evil that had occurred within their faith community and stem any spread of, of sin against the membership, or I should say, amongst the membership. Stop the spread. Remember, a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. So this was the main reason for such a direct action against this transgressor. Furthermore, the expulsion could potentially serve as a wake-up call for this individual that he had to turn away, he had to turn from his evil and seek forgiveness from a forgiving God. In so doing, that gentleman might, just might, at some point, once he has come to terms with his sin, sought forgiveness from the Father, turn from his wicked ways, just possibly he might be restored to the body and reacquire his salvation. Verse 5 of chapter 5. So Shaul again chides the assembly members for their permissive and grossly negligent mishandling of this situation, and he provides the members of the assembly a reason why their lack of spiritual responsiveness and irresponsibility in dealing with this situation was as troubling and dangerous as the fornicator's sin. Shaul reminds the assembly leaders that their permissiveness, that is their boasting, of this situation was shameful. It was not good. And he reminds them that it only takes a little leaven, the fermenting agent that makes dough rise. It, well, it takes a little leaven to cause the whole batch, the whole lump of dough to rise. Now, the use of the concept and term leaven here by Shaul is brilliant. It's brilliant. For the apostles' metaphoric use of the concept and term, leaven was effective in relaying how sin, corruption, and evil within the body or community, although at times starting off with or involving just one or two individuals, well, can quite easily in time spread and pervert others within the community, as evident in verse 6 of chapter 5. That's why, that's why, in great part, Abba did not tolerate unresolved or unaddressed sin to exist among his people back in the day. For Abba clearly recognized that if sin is permitted to go unaddressed among a people, that sin would spread throughout the community and cause that community to turn away from him and turn their eyes away from him and his ways. And this is clearly spelled out in Deuteronomy chapter 13, verse 5, Deuteronomy chapter 19, verse 19, Deuteronomy chapter 24, verse 7, Deuteronomy chapter 17, verse 7, and Deuteronomy 21, verse 21. Do you get the sense that Father really wants to get across that he, you need to get rid of sin 
out of the community, purge it out. And so the eternal sees, and he views such a situation as was described in our discussion here today from the perspective of sin being contagious in nature. Thus, he established that his set-apart community has the potential of being defiled as long as the transgressor, along with their sin, is allowed to operate in the community's midst. Numbers chapter 35, verse 33, and Deuteronomy chapter 19, verse 10. In other words, there must be an immediate reckoning of the situation and righteous action taken to expel that evil from their midst. So, Shaul instructs his Corinthian readers to purge out, that is, ekathero, ekathero, purge out, to cleanse out, to clean thoroughly the old hamets, the old leaven from their lives. Verse 7 of chapter 5. In other words, the apostle was metaphorically instructing his readers to clean out, to get rid of, to remove from their lives that which has the potential of corrupting them and leading them to sin. The apostle instructed them to root out evil from their lives and in effect become sin conscious in their walk with Mashiach, their walk with Messiah, because when that metaphorical leaven is allowed to fester in their lives, allowed to fester in their midst, it has the very real potential of spreading and causing systematic or systemic and organizational breakdown, causing corruption within the system and a community-wide turning away from the ways of Yah. Now, I mentioned sin consciousness, Let me take a brief moment to explain what I mean by this term or this phrase, however you want to look at it. We know that Torah was given to us so that we would have knowledge of that which Yah disapproves of and that which Yah considers as sin or considers to be sin. So Torah serves to inform of that which Yah hates and of that are those things that we must avoid as his chosen ones. So according to some in fundamental Christianity, <laughs> you'll get the, <laughs> wait, do you hear this? There are some in fundamental Christianity that say there is an inherent danger that is tied to one being focused on whether or not they are walking in covenant with Yah and his ways, and whether or not they are pleasing Yah and are not sinning. You see, for some, it is believed that when one dwells too much on their sin, that they become sin conscious. And according to these, sin consciousness is, quote, an attitude or state of mind wherein we tend to focus on sin's power, magnifying it instead of God's grace in Christ Jesus, end quote. In other words, constantly thinking, according to these folks, constantly thinking about sin, quote, makes us or makes one want to do it, end quote. And this is from an article written by a J.B. Kachilla. J.B. Kachilla, again, the references are in the show notes for your uh, reference and your, um, your convenience. And he wrote this in the magazine Christian Today back on November 19th in the year 2016. Now, the author concludes his rather lengthy article on the subject of being sin conscious by admonishing his readers to be grace conscious instead, meaning that they should always be filling their hearts and minds with gratitude for what Messiah, in his words, what Christ has done for them. Others also support this same thinking or a similar understanding that Sin increases with knowledge of Torah. (laughs) These contend that the law 
actually provokes sin as some, in my opinion, understand or interpret Romans chapter 7 verse 8. And this is the crux of the problem here is, and is this kind of wonky interpretation of Romans chapter 7 verse 8. Remember why we're here, because the writings of Shaul are oftentimes difficult to understand and interpret. And this didn't come from Paul himself. It came from a fellow apostle, Peter, who said, this man, he's brilliant, he's smart, but sometimes the stuff he writes and teaches and says, I don't get it. I just don't get it. And so the basis of this wonky understanding of sin consciousness, which I, I've heard of sin consciousness before, but I never heard that it was from the perspective of if you focus on sin or if you focus on the Torah and what constitutes a sin, it's going to cause you to sin. It's going to entice you to sin. I was like, really? Well, I can see where this comes from. It comes from a, a, a strange or what I would call a wonky interpretation of Romans chapter 7, verse 8, which reads, But sin, finding opportunity in the commandment to express itself, got a hold on me. This is Shaul talking. Got a hold on me and aroused and stimulated all kinds of forbidden desires, such as lust and covetousness. And this is the Amplified Version or the Amplified Bible Version. Then I it was the one Bible that I could reach for out of the blue because I was doing some uh, checking on my notes here and I didn't have this passage written out. So the first thing that hit my hand was this Amplified Bible. So I was using it. So please don't, don't uh, be thrown off by this interpretation or its wording. But I'll start again from the beginning. But sin, finding opportunity in the commandment, to express itself got a hold on me and aroused and stimulated all kinds of forbidden desires, such as lust and covetousness. For without the law, sin is dead. The sense of it as is inactive and a lifeless thing. Okay? Now, I'm not entirely opposed to the entirety of J.B. Kachilla's premise and understanding of sin consciousness. I'll just state that right out the front. The problem I have, though, with his or her, and I don't know if it's a man or woman, it's, I, I don't know, but the problem I have with their or his or her explanation of this concept of sin consciousness is that it misses the fact that we who are Yah's elect, well, we have by virtue of our redeemed status as Yah's covenant-keeping people, well, we have inherited the power and wherewithal to just simply say no to sin. Of course, through the power and agency of Yah's Ruach HaKodesh, Yah's Holy Spirit. And the other thing I want to mention that is in opposition to the traditionalist understanding of sin consciousness is that the introduction or the gifting of Torah to Yah's chosen ones. Well, cause the knowledge of or understanding of what Yah considers as sin to increase. And because of this reality, according to them, the very same introduction of Torah coupled with the work of Yeshua Messiah also caused grace to abound all the more. We, through Torah, learned that we were in a desperate situation and in need of a Savior. Now, my view of sin consciousness is diametrically opposite of that of most fundamentalists. For I see sin consciousness not as a thing to avoid or fear or marginalize, but I see sin consciousness as something that every child of the Most High must possess. Knowing how Yah views certain behaviors and what Yah identifies as sin is paramount to the child of Yah maintaining a substantive covenant relationship with the eternal. And in order for the child of Yah to be scripturally sin conscious, he or she must know and understand Torah. 
He or she must live Torah. He or she must study Torah to the point that he or she recognizes what behaviors Yah approves of and what behavior Yah does not approve of. You see, orthodoxy, fundamentalist, evangelicals, in their rejection of Torah, demand their adherents focus on their version of God's grace. Not Yah's version of God's grace, their version of God's grace. They don't want their people keeping Torah, nor do they really want them having a relationship with the Almighty. Let's be honest. Instead, they want their people to have a true and substantive relationship with the church triumphant. And they want them keeping their laws. They want them keeping their organization's Torah, if you will. So the organization's leaders have encouraged their adherents to not study their Bibles and to learn what thus saith the, what saith the law, what, what thus saith Yah, or what thus saith the Lord. They don't want them to know what the Lord is saying. Instead, what these organizations have been doing, these have underhandedly taught their followers to study and learn and follow the teachings and ways of the church triumphant. That's what they're doing. For the church triumphant tells the people what to believe, how to act, how to live, what to do and what not to do, what to focus on in their lives and what not to focus on in their lives and so much more. And if you notice, when you turn on Christian television shows today, there is rarely, if any, mention or teachings given by church leaders directly from Scripture. You see, church pastors, teachers, preachers, and what have you, well, they're, they are not interested in teaching their followers to abstain from sin and to resist taking the broad pathway that leads to destruction, as such as mentioned in Matthew chapter 7, verse 13. You'll, you'll rarely, if ever, hear these leaders demand that their followers enter the straight gate and walk the narrow way or the narrow path that leads to life. No. The only concern they have for their followers is, is they're entering the broad gate and walking the smooth and wide pathways of their organizations. You know, I remember a song um, used to sing back in my... Baptist church days, <laughs> back in my youth, it, it, it was entitled, It's a Highway to Heaven. And we used to sing that thing to death. And little did we know that <laughs> it was a messed up song. Scripturally, it was a messed up song. Essentially, it's telling folks that it's a free pass to heaven, baby. You just get, you just, you just go ahead and say the sinner's prayer. Maybe we'll dunk you. Maybe we're not in some water over there in the corner in the baptismal pool. And the next thing, you know, oh, you know, don't forget to leave something in the offering box on your way on that highway up to heaven because it's a highway to heaven. <laughs> yes, that's... Uh, those were some times when I look back and I go, oh my goodness, what was I doing? There is no true sense of sin consciousness in the hearts and minds and souls of most would-be believers today. There's no sense of abhorring evil and sin. No sense of recognizing that they've fallen short of Yah's established principles and way of life and that they are in desperate need of a redeemer, such as Shaul mentioned in Romans chapter 3, verses 23 through 25. And frankly, I don't understand the thinking that one who possesses sin consciousness is prone to commit sin. So then, in other words, according to the fundamentalist, the anti-Tor crowd, when one focuses on their sinful state or their propensity to violate Yah's Torah, well, he or she will be prone to violate Yah's Torah. I don't know about you, 
<laughs> but when the scales were dropped from my eyes, <laughs> oh, praise y'all, my heart was softened and my ears were opened to y'all's truth and way of life. And I studied y'all's word and I learned that I was in error and in sin for not keeping his instructions throughout my whole life. So I did not seek to, nor was I enticed to continue violating Yah's Torah. In fact, I was mournful and sorrowful and anxious to make things right with Yah. So I sought vigorously to change my ways and do what thus saith Yehovah, Yahweh, Yahuwah. I had no thought to return to my old ways. When I studied when I found the error of my ways, I sought forgiveness for my sinful life from the eternal through Yeshua, my master, and I changed my ways. Or let's just say through the Holy Spirit, the Ruach HaKodesh's help, my ways were changed. I believe I, like many of you, ultimately became true, biblically supported sin conscious. As I, as we studied Yah's word, I, in fact, became conscious of my missing Yehovah's established marks as outlined in his Torah. And I learned that I was in desperate need of a savior, in desperate need of a redeemer that would rescue me from the penalties associated with my violations of Yah's Torah. And that would ultimately open the door to my having a true and substantive relationship with the eternal him with the eternal himself. True biblical sin consciousness leads to life. A lack of sin consciousness leads to destruction. I believe that. Now, as I'm using my own example here. I don't want you to think I've been living a perfect life since coming to this faith. I have made mistakes. Whoa. I've made some doozies. And you know what? I still make mistakes. But I know which side my spiritual bread is butter. Butter. <laughs> Tongue tied. Bing, bing. I know which side my spiritual bread is buttered. <laughs> That's better. <laughs> When you get to my age, it gets a little hard, so forgive me, but I do know, and I know when I mess up, but my focusing on Torah, my focusing on this content and materials that I'm bringing to you does in no way entice me to sin. So I don't know where these folks are getting their interpretation and ideas of sin consciousness from. I have an idea, I should say, where they get it from, and it's not from the Almighty and His Spirit. But this concept of sin consciousness, I feel, is very timely as we enter into the Pesach season. For it is through this sacred eight-day period that we rehearse the sacrificial atoning ministry of our Master Yahushua the sanctification process that all Yod's chosen ones must participate in, and the prophetic significance of Yeshua, our master, having or being the firstfruits of all who will enter into life eternal through a true, a substantive relationship with the Almighty. And throughout this whole spring feast season, we're reminded to be sin conscious so that we may walk in covenant with our Heavenly Father through the agency, the help, the inspiration of Yah's precious Ruach HaKodesh, His precious Holy Spirit. And I would reference when I'm saying this uh, with Genesis chapter 17, verse 1, Matthew chapter 5, verse 48, and 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1. Our model for walking in covenant with the Almighty is, of course, our Master, Yeshua. Still touching upon the concept of the true child of the Most High being dead to sin, 
which we, we, we discussed, if you recall, in great detail last installment, part two, Torah meets grace. Well, Shaul reminds the Corinthian Messianics that they are supposed to be without corruption and sin. They, in fact, were supposed to be new creatures in Mashiach, new creatures in Messiah. Or in Shaul's metaphorical framework here, they were supposed to be new lumps of dough that is absent in a leavening agent, that is absent corruption, absent evil. Yah's people are receiving a start over, a new beginning, a makeover, a clean slate, if you will, that would allow Yah's Ruach, his Holy Spirit, to be, to be infused into their beings. And Shaul brings this metaphor of that which is leaven versus that which is unleavened home by infusing into his discussion here the underlying prophetic meaning of Pesach, or Passover. The apostle brilliantly acknowledges that all of this, this purging out or cleaning out of his reader's old corrupt ways and bringing them to the place of being new lumps or dough, was made possible by the vicarious sacrifice of Mashiach. As Shaul states it, Yehoshua, Yeshua HaMashiach, is our Pesach, our Passover. Verse 7 of chapter 5. Remember, we're still in 1 Corinthians. And maybe, as evident by the wording of verse 8, in this same chapter, this letter of 1 Corinthians was written sometime close to Pesach. Again, as evident in verse 8. For Shaul encourages the Corinthian Messianics to do what? To keep Pesach, which includes, of course, the Feast of Unleavened Bread and Firstfruits, and to keep these holy set-apart days with a spirit and mindset of them being new lumps of dough devoid of any leavening. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, and Galatians chapter 6, verse 15. So, Shaul essentially instructs his readers that all the foolishness that the apostle was hearing related to their corrupt ways needed to be removed, needed to be purged from their midst and from their respective lives, verse 8 of chapter 5. As individuals, they would be required to stop sinning, Equally important, they were not to tolerate nor entertain sin in their assemblies. Verse 9 of chapter 5. In particular, Shaul brings the original issue that prompted this discussion back to our attention. That being the fornication issue he wrote about in verses 1 and 2. But the apostle goes on to include all manner of sin that if left unchecked by them as a community would bring shame and destruction upon the assembly. Chapter 5, verses 10 through 12. These and all such transgressions, Shaul commands, are to be purged from their midst, as they ultimately would end up doing to the fornicator mentioned at the start of this chapter. And what happens to those that they purge from their midst because of sinful behavior? Well, it would be up to Yah and his righteous judgment. Verse 13. So, having looked at this issue of sin consciousness using the story of the Corinthian assembly and their failure to properly address the fornicator in their midst as a backdrop, I want to spend the remaining of, or the remainder, I should say, of our time here today discussing the upcoming spring feast of Yah, which we all know includes, again, Pesach or Passover, unleavened bread or the feast of matzah, as some say, and the day of first fruits. And we also know that the feast of Yah, which are embedded in his holy Torah, as mentioned by Paul in Romans chapter 7, verse 12, are shadows of good things to come. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 1. And the spiritual relevance 
and substance of these set-apart days can never be overstated nor honored enough, in my humble opinion. Father appointed that our master would die for our sins at an appointed time, in Romans chapter 5, verse 6. So, it should not be a stretch for any who walk in covenant with the Almighty that Yahushua was appointed to die specifically on Pesach or during the spring feast. So whichever date Pesach or Passover fell on the day Yeshua was crucified, some say in the year 27 CE, others say 30 CE AD, still others say 33 AD CE, whichever one you just decide to pick, well, Pesach ranks, Pesach should rank as one of the most important set-apart days on Abba's sacred calendar year. The prophetic shadow picture that was embedded in Pesach and the spring feast of Yah was indeed brought to its fullest realization in the days in which our master was crucified, buried, and resurrected. And we've already seen that the Apostle Shaul makes a poignant correlation between Yeshua's sacrifice and Pesach in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7. Again, our focus passage here for today, kind of, sort of, reads, Clean out the old yeast, the old leaven, so that you may be a new batch of dough. You are, in fact, without yeast or without leaven. For Christ... That is our Messiah, our Mashiach, our Passover, that is our Pesach, has been sacrificed. Shaul here is touching upon the sanctification process, too, in his discussion. And this sanctification process is something that every would-be covenant-walking child of the Most High undergoes. The purging of sin from one's life, and then walking out their faith as new creatures, or as Shaul mentions, as new lumps of dough, is prophetically pictured in the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Yah, in his brilliance, and I can't imagine how he pulled it off, but he did, and he did it in the greatest fashion. He pulled together two set-apart dates on his calendar that were separated by at least a millennium and a half, that is 1,500 years, a millennium and a half, there goes my tongue tightness, a millennium and a half, and he did so to usher in his great plan of salvation, restoration, and redemption. In the process of redeeming his chosen people, Yisrael, from Egyptian bondage back in the day, Jehovah commanded they select for themselves a perfect yearling lamb or goat on the 10th day of the first month, otherwise known as the month of the Aviv. Exodus chapter 12, verse 5. And then on a specific day at a specific time of that day, sound familiar? Slay the creature and apply its blood on the doorpost and lentils of their homes, which again was the 14th day of the month of the Aviv. And soon after this was done, they would prepare the slaughtered lamb to be consumed with other elements as Yah instructed. And the women would prepare bread without leaven in anticipation of a rapid departure from Mitzrayim from Egypt the next morning. As their meal, they would consume the roasted lamb or goat as the death angel passed through Mitzrayim, through Egypt, passing over the homes of those whose doors were marked with the blood of the lamb or goat. The firstborn of those households that were not marked by the blood of the lamb or goat, well, they succumbed to the death angel. This, of course, foreshadowed the sacrificial ministry of our Master Yeshua. In prophetic shadow likeness as our Pesach, our Passover lamb, our Master was perfect and without sin. 
So as Shaul stated, the man who is without sin died for those with sin. The realization of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. And then our master's resurrection was prophetically foreshadowed by the day of first fruits or the wave sheaf offering. Friends, it can never be overstated. Yeshua's death, burial, resurrection, it, well, it can never be tied to pagan horror days such as Lent, Good Friday, and Easter, while denying the truth of the only wise Elohim, the only wise God, his word and his son. Everything about our master and his ministries are intricately tied to and foreshadowed by Yah's glorious feast. That is Yah's set-apart days. As the writer of the Sefer, the book of Hebrews, wrote regarding these set-apart elements of worship of Yehovah, which include Yah's set-apart days or feast days, in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 1, they serve as shadows of good things to come. Praise Yah! As our Pesach, the breach that existed between Yehovah, Yahweh Yahuwah, and humankind since the garden incident was repaired. That breach was repaired. The blood of our Pesach, Yeshua, it covers us from all unrighteousness. In so doing, we escape eternal death, which is a natural byproduct of sin. And upon entering into covenant with the Almighty, we become sin conscious, or at least we should, biblically speaking. Not consumed now over the sins we've committed in our lives as orthodoxy has defined sin consciousness, but we become conscious of the fact that we are called, that we are chosen to be new creatures in Mashiach. As new creatures in Mashiach, we are as corpse to sin. Sin is supposed to be a foreign entity to us, even an enemy, if you will. And anything that hints of sin in our walk with Mashiach, especially during our time of being sanctified or set apart unto Jehovah, we are to purge it from our lives. We are to turn away from it with the ever-present help of Yah's Ruach HaKodesh, His Holy Spirit. And the thing that drives me uber crazy is that orthodoxy and fundamentalists reject the significance of Yah's set-apart days. And they even marginalize the spiritually charged historical significance that Pesach and unleavened bread must play in the life of every one of Yah's set-apart people. No, these, 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 these individuals choose to hang their spiritual hats on a set of pagan holidays instead, attaching to what I like to call horror days, the death, burial, and resurrection of our Master Yeshua. And as honorable and well-meaning as the orthodox and fundamentalist may appear to some to be related to their keeping of Easter, Lent, and so forth, in lieu of Yah's spring feast, these are sincerely wrong and mistaken in their understanding and beliefs and in their practice. Theirs is a willful disobedience that will ultimately lead to their being judged by a holy and righteous Elohim. We, on the other hand, who have been called and chosen to image Jehovah Elohim on this earth, in particular, image him within the confines of communities and spheres of influence he's placed each of us into, we recognize and we cherish which side our spiritual bread is buttered. We recognize that the feasts are not the feast of the Jews, but of Jehovah, Yahweh Yahuwah. He who gifted them to us. And because we've chosen to walk in covenant with him and to love him with our whole being, dying to self in the process and walking in the newness of life, well, we keep and walk out his commandments. Halak, 
which include his annual feast. And we keep and walk out these feasts in spirit and in truth, knowing that each set-apart day on the Eternal's calendar serves as a reminder of that which he has, is, and will be doing for us in his great plan and work of redemption, restoration, and salvation. So, as the spring feast of Pesach, unleavened bread, and first fruits approach this coming week, we prayerfully and meditatively prepare to receive the days. And if you're like me, I love rereading, studying, meditating on the Exodus and our Master's Passion stories. I do that every year. And some of you may also benefit from listening to or watching teachings on various aspects of Pesach, as well as attending fellowship gatherings and services during this time. However, the Ruach, the Holy Spirit, leads you. I say do it with joy and passion. Then the night before Pesach, known in Hebrew as Erev Pesach, which takes place on 3-27-21 of this year. Most people will be keeping it then. I would then encourage you to honor the occasion of the last meal our master had with his inner core of disciples, which is famously referred to as the Last Supper. And many of you will attend special services that not only mark this most solemn historic event on a true Messianic's annual calendar, but also delve into the spiritual meaning and applications that are associated with the various elements of that sacred gathering. And I've personally attended a number of services and gatherings on on this uh, most solemn night of the month of the Aviv, and I've always, I've always been blessed by those experiences. Uh, I've not had the opportunity or wherewithal in the last two, ooh, ooh, several years to attend a, a service like that. Probably the last six or seven years it's been. It's been a while. But um, I, do, I do recall those services that I attended fondly. Those were really wonderful times of fellowship and learning. And it was just a good experience. And uh, generally speaking, in these services, we find that bread and wine is shared and consumed by attendees of these gatherings. And solemn memory of, as Shaul wrote to the Corinthian Messianics, the master's death till he comes in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 26. And this is popularly referred to, of course, as communion, especially in the Orthodox, Evangelical, and Fundamental circles. And many Messianics actually overlook this beautiful ritual since it is not part and parcel of the Exodus story. You know, we we Messianics like to really just focus on the Exodus story. And so we don't really get into (laughs) anything having to do with Yeshua's passion. But again, in my humble opinion, and it's just my opinion, ignoring or intentionally failing to honor this spiritually rich and poignant historic event, well, it, 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 it's, 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 an, it's a violation of Master's instruction to perform this beautiful ritual in solemn remembrance of him and what he has, is, and will do for us. Luke chapter 22, verse 19. And I will mention here that there is, in fact, historical precedence that the early first century Messianic assemblies kept this solemn ritual, with some assemblies going so far as to keep this ritual and instruction of our master each Sabbath. So for those who say, no, we don't need to do that, we don't do, we just keep the Pesach, the Passover that's in Exodus, we don't do that Last Supper, that communion thing. Well, I would encourage you to rethink it, to pray about it, to meditate on it, because I really would put forth to you that this is something that we are called to do by our master. As our master, we being his disciples, we are called to do and follow his example. 
And I want to also mention that some groups, in addition to honoring our master's last meal, well, they partake in a foot washing ritual to imitate our master's washing his disciples' feet. And this is done to, re, or I should say, this is done in response to master's instructions to his disciples, where he said, if I then, your Lord and master, have washed your feet, ye also ought to wash one another's feet. And this is found in John chapter 13, verse 14. Now, I get it. Many of you, you, you and many in our faith community today, they, they reject. They decline to participate in foot washing ceremonies, citing that this was done by and passed on by our master as part of a common hygienic practice of first century Middle Easterners and is not applicable or necessary for today's messianics to keep or practice. And I recently heard this, this um, taught and preached by a messianic teacher who calls himself an apostle. Um, and he taught this, that we don't do this because we're, we would be imitating a hygienic practice that is not necessary today. And they, and they set aside any relevant spiritual application that Yeshua may have been attempting to convey to his disciples through this practice of foot washing at that time. Um, so there is this emerging teaching out there that we're not to do that as messianic believers as covenant but now i'll tell you i've participated in a number of foot washing ceremonies throughout my walk in this faith of ours and i understand where those who reject foot washing ceremonies for today's messianics are coming from however Here's my high hour, however, for tonight. I, I will say that I find such reverential practices as foot washing ceremonies to be an individual, rich, uh, ruach, spirit-led choice, if you will, that each messianic must come to terms with. And I will say also that any who would be led to participate in such a ritual or ceremony, y'all bless you. And may you find rich meaning in your honoring of Yeshua's example. And regardless which side you go with on this issue of foot washing, to use Shaul's vernacular, hey, don't let no one, <laughs> and I'm using proper English here, let no one judge you in your keeping of the foot washing tradition or not especially as it relates to your doing that which the Ruach HaKodesh leads you to do. And that's for both sides. If you don't keep foot washing, don't let anyone judge you on that. If you do keep foot washing, don't let no one judge you. <laughs> that's between you and Father. Obviously, if you are not privy, let's say, to being a part of a fellowship or a messianic group that honors our Master's Last Meal ceremony, or that practices foot washing, well, earnestly seek Yah's will for you in that respect. And if he leads you to keep this honoring ceremony of the master's last meal alone, then keep it alone with as much reverence and truth and joy that you can muster. Obviously, you can't do the foot washing unless you're washing your own feet, but that's another story. <laughs> but it is always preferable or preferable in proper English, <laughs> that we be in convocation with other like-minded brethren as Yah makes those opportunities available to us. It was the writer of Hebrews who actually addressed this concern when he wrote, and let us take thought of how to spur one another on to love and good works, that is, good deeds, not abandoning our own meetings as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging each other, and even more so because you see the day drawing near. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24 and 25. That was the New English translation rendering. <clears throat> the point of convocating with other like-minded brethren, especially during this set-apart season, is to not only facilitate our personal growth in Mashiach, in Messiah, but also to encourage one another in these last and evil days. 
moving on. Pesach, of course, falls on the next evening at sundown after the Lord's last meal night. And in this year, it's on, it falls on 328, which, by the way, dovetails seamlessly into the start of the seven-day Feast of Unleavened Bread, also referred to by some as the Feast of Matzah. As Torah-honoring people of Yah, we keep this night to the best of our ability as Yah's Ruach so leads. Hillary and I generally read the applicable Exodus passages as we partake in a modest meal consisting of roasted lamb and bitter herbs. And we also begin our week-long eating of unleavened bread at this time. A couple things come to mind in my discussing our keeping of Pesach and unleavened bread. At the very least, prior to our having the Pesach meal, Hillary and I will have saw to it that all leaven and leaven-type products have been discarded from our home in obedience to Exodus chapter 12, verse 19, and Exodus chapter 13, verse 7. In fact, I took out the last batch of leaven products to the trash bin this morning. Um, and, to, and well, actually, I did that last night, not this morning. I did, so it got picked up with today's trash. But yes, um, we're very... Um, much aware and focused on doing that, and I would encourage you to do so as well. It's in obedience to Yah's commands to do so. He said, no leaven is to be found in your midst or in the land. And obviously, in this case, we're not living in the land, but your sphere of influence, your land is your home and the land upon which your home sits. So you are supposed to Purge out leaven from your home and not consume leaven for the next seven days. Secondly, it should be noted that Pesach day or Passover day itself is not a so-called high holy day. And that being said, one is certainly permitted to work if it is necessary for them to do so. However, once sundown hits... And as we go directly into our Pesach meal and the Feast of Unleavened Bread commences, well, we will enter into a high holy day whereby we are to convene, we are to proclaim, to declare a holy convocation, a rehearsal, and we are to do so, we are to do no servile work, no servile work during that 24 hour period. And our focus then must be be upon Yah and what he's done, what he's doing, and what he will do for us. Focusing on his will, his ways. And we are encouraged to keep this set apart time as Shaul instructed his Corinthian readers with the unleavened bread of sincerity in truth. 1 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 8. Now, as a faith community, we are all over the place as it, as it pertains to our keeping Pesach. Let's be honest. For instance, many Messianics choose to go the route of the traditional Jewish Seder on pass, for the Passover meal. Well, I'll tell you, Hillary and I, on the other hand, do not participate in Seders, so to speak. And the reason we do not participate in Orthodox Jewish type Passover seders is because they're highly regulated by rabbinic traditions. And unfortunately, over the centuries, paganism has seeped into and tainted Yah's commanded Passover meal. Torah outlines what the actual Passover meal is supposed to consist of. But the Orthodox Passover seder includes elements and traditions that Yah never told us to include in his meal. Abba commanded us not to add nor to diminish from that which he has commanded us to do. Now, I recognize that a sizable chunk of the members of our faith community are drawn to and are loyal to many such Jewish traditions, such as the Passover Seder, and of course, it falls to each of us to walk out our faith, as Shaul wrote to his Philippian readers, with fear and trembling. I'm not judging. I would never judge anyone who chooses to participate 
and a Passover Seder. That's between you and y'all. I don't have a heaven or hell to put you in. So I don't, I don't want to say I don't care. Of course I care. I find it fascinating what y'all or how y'all leads people to do what they do on his set apart days. As long as you do the basic things, no work, convocate as much as you can or as y'all permits. That's the framework in which we are supposed to do these things. And the rest is up to the spirit to lead us. So I would only advise caution when choosing how you will keep, how you will observe, how you will honor Pesach in the Passover meal. And I'd say let Yah's Ruach properly lead you in this respect. Now, the seven days of the Feast of Unleavened Bread is similar to Sukkot, that is the Feast of Tabernacles, in that we are to proclaim and convene holy convocations as well as do no servile work on the first and last days of both these week-long feasts. And this is all outlined in Leviticus chapter 23, the go-to feast chapter. However, the days that fall between the first and the last days, we are free to go about our day-to-day affairs. But the thing that sets both these week-long festivals apart from some of the other set-apart days of Yah is that they were originally pilgrimage feasts. Now, of the seven mandated feasts or set-apart days of Yah's sacred calendar year, Father appointed three of them as pilgrimage feasts. And those three pilgrimage feasts include Pesach, or Unleavened Bread, Shavuot, or Pentecost, and Sukkot, or the Feast of Tabernacles. And this, of course, is outlined again in Exodus chapter 23, specifically in verses 14 through 17, and repeated in Deuteronomy chapter 16, verse 16. It is not coincidence that these three pilgrimage feasts take place Place during our ancient cousins' three major harvest f- seasons or um, times of the year where the harvest took place. Spring, summer, and fall. Pesach, unleavened bread during the spring harvest. Shavuot, or Pentecost during the summer harvest. And Sukkot, or tabernacles during the fall harvest. As pilgrimage feasts, our ancient cousins were required to leave their homes and to journey to the place where Yah placed his name over in response to these harvest seasons. The ultimate, the most well-known of these sacred places was, of course, Jerusalem. We all know about Jerusalem, but there were other places such as Shiloh. And it was at these sacred places, the place where the Ark of the Covenant rested within the tabernacle or tent of meeting and ultimately the temple in Jerusalem, that Yah's people would gather and joyously worship the Almighty and their giving of tithes and offerings that were based upon the proceeds and the increase they received from their harvest. Additionally, The pilgrims would receive teachings of Yah's word. They would undergo various washings and purifications, otherwise known as mikvahs. And there would, of course, be recitations of prayers and scripture at these gatherings. With Yah's temple and or tabernacle no longer in operation at Jerusalem, well, we really can't keep these three pilgrimage feasts as Yah or as Torah puts forth. However, that's my second however for tonight. There's nothing stopping us from keeping these pilgrimage feasts in spirit and in truth. As long as we keep the basic elements of the feast and we do them in spirit and in truth, Yah will work individually with us to direct us in the ways he wants us to worship him and keep his appointed times. Now, I don't in any way mean to suggest that you keep the pilgrimage feast of unleavened bread as I am led to do. You see, this is an issue again between you and Yah. 
I'm simply giving you here that which Hillary and I have been led to do over the many years we've walked in covenant with the eternal. I'm simply sharing with you what we do. <clears throat> On these three pilgrimage set apart days, we would traditionally, Hillary and I, arrange taking the time off from our day-to-day -day lives. When we worked, we would take the time off from work. And if possible and available, we would travel to assemblies where like-minded brethren were keeping these feast days. When those opportunities were not available to us, such as this year happened, actually, we're kind of in a particular uh, different situation. Having just relocated, we really haven't settled down fully yet. So we won't be seeking out fellowship outside of our home this year. Well, we will set aside the week of unleavened bread as holy and special and honor that time with focused studies, prayers, celebration, and the like. You see, upon our coming into covenant with Jehovah and walking in this faith, we chose to abandon yearly secular vacations in exchange for the pilgrimage feast. The pilgrimage feasts were, I guess you could say, our vacation times away from our secular lives. And because we fully incorporated the Feast of Yah into our lives to such a degree, we have been enormously blessed and our walk with Mashiach has been notably enhanced. I'll have to say. Again, this is not in any way to suggest that you do the same. The only thing I would suggest to you is that you seek Yah's perfect will for your life and Messiah, and then walk out that will with reverence, joy, and peace in the Ruach HaKodesh. I'm not giving you a pass. I'm not giving you a pass on what scripture says you're supposed to do. We're supposed to keep the feast. We're supposed to on the high holy days. We're not supposed to do any work. We're supposed to convene a holy convocation when possible and so forth and so forth. But beyond those baseline elements that Torah stipulates, we keep the feast in spirit and in truth. You see, if you seek him, if you seek Yah, if you ask him to lead you, he will do it. As long as you, well, as long as your heart is where it's supposed to be. Regardless, we must keep the feast of Yah in spirit and in truth. The particulars of how we keep them is between you and Yah. So getting back to the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which hits at sundown on 328 and runs through sundown on 4-4 this year, well, we are actually commanded to consume unleavened bread or matzah during these seven days. And this is documented in Exodus chapter 12, chapter 13, chapter 23, chapter 34, and then in Leviticus chapter 6 and 23. So by this time of the Holy Week, we should have purged all unleavened or all leavened products from our homes before the Paschal or the Pesach meal hits. And in so doing, our meals for the remainder of that Holy Week are to consist in part of unleavened bread, properly known as matzah. Last week, I actually, uh, as an aside, I purchased a large box of matzah, which is what I do every year before Passover hits. And as we do each year during unleavened bread, we incorporate into each meal during that week matzah. In fact, we consume matzah during that week for every meal, of course, in honor and in obedience to Yah's commandments to do so. And during this week of unleavened bread, we assess our walk with Mashiach. And we ask Yah to reveal to us areas of our lives where, where sin besets us. The writer of Hebrews in, uh, instructed his readers to strip off and throw aside every encumbrance that is unnecessary weight and that sin which so readily so deftly so cleverly clings to and entangles us and let us run with patient endurance and steady and active persistence the appointed course of the race that is set before us 
Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. Indeed, the week of unleavened bread is a perfect time and opportunity to take assessment of the state of our walk in Messiah and seek, with the help of the Ruach HaKodesh, to do the very thing that the writer of Hebrews instructs. Last but not least, we have the rather obscure day of first fruits, as mentioned in Leviticus chapter 23, verses 9 through 14. And Shaul described Yeshua as the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 20. Now, the first fruits or the wave sheaf offering was to take place within the week of Pesach and unleavened bread. It was a day intended for Yah's people to offer unto Yah the first of their spring harvest. And until they presented unto the Levitical priest at the tabernacle or temple the first of their spring harvest in the form of a sheaf of barley to weigh before Yah in solemn acknowledgement of Yah's sovereignty over their lives and over the work of their hands and their increase or income. They would not be permitted to consume any of their harvested grain or produce until after they'd presented an offering consisting of the first fruits of their harvest to the Levitical priest who would waive that offering before Yah on their behalf. The other important aspect of the day of first fruits, which cannot be overlooked, is that it is the day that we begin the 49 day count towards Shavuot or Pentecost, the second of three pilgrimage feasts. And the thing about first fruits is that the day on which it is kept by Yah's people must always be correct and spot on. Otherwise, Shavuot will be miscalculated and it will fall upon the wrong day on the calendar. And so it becomes important for Yah's people to be fully aware of the days upon which Yah's spring feasts occur in order that they keep Shavuot or Pentecost at its appointed time. Now, as it relates to us today, we honor the day of first fruits, which, depend, depending on the calendar you follow, falls on the last day of unleavened bread this year, which is 4 4. Doing good works, and many of us will bless ministries that feed and nourish us with free will offerings and such. Now, I literally just scratched the surface as it relates to the spring feast. And I will tell you that there are a ton of excellent teachings out there that go into much greater detail than I have here. On the spring feast, on Pesach, on leavened bread, uh, on, um, and on first fruits, there are many, many uh, teachings out there that are really sound, biblically sound teachings and things. And there are also teachings out there <clears throat> that um, um, look at different aspects of Pesach and different aspects of, of this spring season, this spring feast that you may not get with the traditional teachings. One such uh, teaching that was recently posted this past Monday, the second day of the week, uh, <clears throat> by a dear brother and friend and uh, messianic brother, teacher, brilliant teacher, um, who doesn't always take the traditional routes taken by many messianic teachers, but I love this, this brother's teachings. He, he just sees things that aren't always apparent. Um, the name of his website is, um, highpursuitsministries.com. Uh, let me just verify so that I don't steer you wrong. It is highpursuitministries.com. I had said high pursuits, but I have it saved on my browser. So all I do is just type in high and it pops up, but, um, highpursuitministries.com, uh, brother Robert, uh, does a teaching, uh, just posted a teaching last week on, uh, Pesach and it, it, it all is focused on cleanliness, on being clean, on cleansing. So I wouldn't get, that's what the, the point of me is not so much to necessarily steer you to him as much as to tell you that there are options you have out there for teachings and learning of the things of Yah and his feast and different perspectives on the things that 
are being figured out and taught and learned by Yah's anointed teachers and preachers and so forth, uh, such as Brother Robert and High Pursuit Ministries. So check that out when you get a chance, as well as check out some of the other teachings. But I said all of that to just say that my intention was not to provide a thorough study of the Spring Feast, but rather to give you somewhat of a broad brush overview and to share with you some insights that I've gained in my years of keeping Yah's Feast. I simply love the Feast of Yah, and I said this earlier. I love everything about them, and I look forward each calendar year to not only keeping them and seeing what Yah wants me to do and keeping them for that particular year, but also I look forward to the spiritual growth, most importantly the spiritual growth that naturally comes when we throw our whole selves into keeping these appointed sacred times of Yah's calendar year. You see, there's no doubt about it, friends. We are compelled to keep these feasts, these set-apart days. We can try as we may to reason around not keeping them. And in our working around and trying to make an excuse or make up excuses why we can't keep y'all's set-apart feast, I've heard many people say, well, we can't keep the feast like it is in Torah, so therefore we're not obligated to teach or to actually obligated to keep the feast. No, you have to keep the feast. That's the whole point about keeping Yah's ways and his word and his feast in spirit and in truth. Yah will lead and guide you in how to do these things. Because if we don't keep his feast, if we do fall for the foolishness of finding excuses for not keeping Yah's feast, we ultimately end up finding ourselves at odds with the Creator, who from the beginning stipulated that His set-apart people must hear His voice. They must keep His Torah and His ways, which of course includes keeping His Moedim, His set-apart days. So let us keep Pesach, unleavened bread, first fruits with all the joy and reverence and anticipation we can muster and not let the world influence us otherwise. Like our ancient Hebrew cousins, we have been redeemed. Redeemed from those entities and redeemed for those things that have kept us in bondage. So we no longer answer to those entities and things. For we have been redeemed and we have been bought with a price. <laughs> and Oh, what a price that was paid on our behalf by our master, Yeshua Messiah. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 20, and 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 23. Shaul instructed his readers, knowing the steep price that was paid on our behalf, on their behalf, for their redemption, for our redemption, to glorify Jehovah with their bodies, to glorify Jehovah with our bodies. For our bodies have replaced the temple and tabernacle of old as Yah's dwelling place. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16, and 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19. Therefore, we have no excuse when it comes to keeping Yah's feast. So let's keep his feast with righteousness, peace, and joy in the Ruach HaKodesh as we purge out the leaven and the old man and old woman, and walk in the newness of life. Well, <laughs> that will do it for this week's installment of TMTO. Y'all willing, we'll bring this series within a series to a much-deserved close in our next installment, and we will finally get to the point of interpreting and defining do you hear the crowd clapping? <laughs> we'll finally get to the point of interpreting and defining what Shaul meant by the phrase under the law. Have a blessed and meaningful Pesach, unleavened bread, and first fruits, beloved. And until next time, and as always, may you be most blessed, fellow saints in training. I bid you Shabbat Shalom. Shalom. Take care.